14, and we'll try as best we can to wrap up today and uh, get through uh, the subject matter of abandoned to Christ. We've been looking at this now for a couple of weeks with the time that we've been in, and uh, part of that's because of our schedule and being out, uh, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to be here. Um, someone may say, well, uh, you're kind of like uh, the preacher I remember. I've shared the testimony a time or two that was in uh, college, and they would let him preach chapel from time to time, and um, he would always... Uh, preach and uh, he'll preach about uh, sins and transgression and various things and finally uh, some of the faculty came to him and said uh, don't you know that God is love and there are some things in the Bible besides sin you can preach on and uh, so he said okay and he began to study and pray and they asked him to preach in chapel again a few weeks after that and he came back and uh, he said I want you to turn your Bible over there in first John and um, he was talking about all that's in the world and uh, he talks about the lust of the flesh the pride of life and so forth and um, he says, I want you to know, the Bible says, I'm going to preach on love this morning because I've been rebuked on my sin. And so he said, I'm going to preach on love. Love not the world. And uh, so he <laughs> preached on all the, all the things that um, is listed in the scriptures there. And uh, as I think about it, I really meant this to be a more on a positive note, abandoned to Christ and forsaken all we have. And it seems like uh, as you get into the study of the scriptures and sometimes things you have to deal with, and uh, going through it, uh, things just kind of naturally move the direction they do. So, um, Brother Sis, we had the opportunity of uh, hearing him preach last night. Don Sis was the director of BIMI uh, for some years. Uh, Brother Gregory's church was preaching during the awesome August uh, meetings and uh, 90 years old, been preaching for 69 years, been in 89 countries, almost half of the countries on the world, on the globe, and um, then also traveled a little over three and a half million miles by air and uh, stood and preached, it was a good positive message. And I thought, man, I wish I could preach like that. But uh, I guess it takes both sides of the spectrum to have a balance and to get it out. So as we look at this passage of scripture, uh, we'll notice if you would please with me this morning, I'll read it again in its entirety. Uh, uh, Luke chapter number 14, beginning in verse number 25. Uh, notice he says, and there, went out, and there went great multitudes with him and he turned and he said unto them, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able uh, to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able to with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else while the others uh, yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, and again, here's that statement, he cannot be my disciple. In this passage of scripture, we find on three different occasions, Jesus said, if you don't meet these certain requirements, that you cannot be my disciple. And so as I begin to study this text, I use this as a foundational text here in our missionary candidate classes on uh, dealing with deputation principles and what the Bible has to say about deputation. You say, well, I don't see anything in this text dealing with deputation. It's not dealing specifically with that, but there are certain conditions that are laid out and there are certain principles that uh, are laid out concerning deputation ministry, not just deputation for a missionary, but I believe all uh, types of ministry. And so when we consider this matter, we've been speaking on the subject matter of abandon to Christ, uh, forsaking all, leaving everything we have, including the Bible says our own life, and following the Lord. Now notice if you would, and I'm not gonna be redundant this morning, but notice he said in verse number 26, that if any man come to me, and so we find the call, uh, that is to come to the Lord and uh, to be willing to forsake all, to uh, come to him. And I believe it's not specifically dealing with salvation, but I believe that when we first come to him, it's in the matter of salvation. And the Bible says, they that seek him shall find him. I'm not going to go into all of that. We've uh, touched base on that subject matter uh, on several occasions. So first, the call is to come to him. And then second, we find the command, notice in verse number 27, and whosoever hath not uh, whosoever doth not bear his cross, and then notice this phrase, come after me, cannot be my disciple. And so if we don't come to him, if we don't 
call upon him, we cannot be his disciples. And if we don't come after him, and we mentioned that that means to pursue him. They that seek me shall find me. And the Bible speaks about making a full surrender to the Lord. And so then this is the command to come after him, to pursue him, to seek after him. And then notice the cost. He goes into uh, verse number 28, which of you intended to build a tower, set them not down first, and then watch this, and counteth the cost. And so we must consider the cost of discipleship. And to be a disciple of Christ costs something. If you don't believe me, and I don't necessarily endorse the outreach of the ministry, but it is an excellent resource for Christians. I've mentioned it before, and that is the voice of the martyrs. And they keep up with uh, those that have been persecuted for Christ, those that have been put to death for Christ. It's estimated that since the death of Christ on the cross of Calvary, there have been an estimate of over 65 million people that have been martyred for the name of Christ and for the sake of Christ. And so uh, there is a cost in discipleship. I believe one of the reasons in America we are in the condition we are in spiritually and we have weak Christians, anemic Christians, and our churches, I believe, are filled with the unconverted, those that have their name on the church roll, but their name is not on heaven's roll. They've never truly and genuinely been converted to Christ. And so as a result of that, uh, there is the worldly influx and input and influence in our churches. And so there is a count uh, accounting of the cost for following Christ. And when we consider that matter, we talked about uh, we are commanded to forsake all, to follow the Lord. Uh, we've looked at Numbers 15 and 39, Deuteronomy 4, 29 through 31. And yesterday we began with Psalm 10, and I believe we made it all the way down to verse number five. And so I'd like to try to finish that out today and just give you a brief closing thought on the subject matter. And we'll pick up in verse number five. He's talking about the sinner, the ungodly, of the heathen, and he says his ways are always grievous. We touched base on that yesterday. <clears throat> Thy judgments are far above, out of his sight. For all of his enemies, he puffeth at them. And so basically it's saying that uh, those that disregard God will find out exactly the depth of their disdain and disregard for him later in the text. But he says that God's judgment is far above, out of his sight. And so uh, the heathen counts God as nothing, the ungodly man, the unrighteous man, and he considers the fact that God does not exist or God does not consider his sin and transgression. But here the psalmist says that God's judgment is out of the sight of the wicked. They don't see the hand of God moving until it's too late. And then notice that the Bible says in verse number six, he, th he has said in his heart, I shall not be moved for I shall never be in adversity. In other words, he's always right. He's full of pride. He's full of arrogance. And uh, he says, I'm standing right where I'm at. I'm not wrong. I'll never be moved. I'm always uh, right. I'll never be in diversity. His mouth in verse number seven is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. And so he talks about the secret things, the hidden agenda of this man's heart. And so again, we're talking about counting the cost, abandoning for Christ. And I want to say this, it's not just the vile, the wicked, and the ungodly that sometimes have ulterior motives. Uh, after being in the ministry of uh, preaching now for 46 years and full-time missionary service for 37 and a half years, unfortunately, I've seen a lot of people over the years that have ulterior motives. Um, some Christians in the workplace put on a good spiritual front, but their heart is wicked and vile. They have an ulterior motive. Don't think for one second God in heaven doesn't see that and that God in heaven doesn't move his hand against them. And I like what the old preacher said many years ago. That is that the grinding wheel of God's judgment grinds slow but sure. It always catches up in the end. And so here is the man that is vile and wicked. And he says, God's not going to do anything. I've been doing this and getting by with it. But do, be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever man yes. soweth, that shall he also reap. And so here is this man who thinks that God's blind, God's deaf, God's dumb, God cannot hear and God cannot see. And so as a result of that, he said, I shall not be moved. And uh, he says, I'll never be in adversity. Notice in verse number eight, God's going to get his say so in just a minute. Let's get through the vile man's uh, position first. 
He sitteth in the lurking, lurking places of the villages. In the secret place doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth them into his net. Notice this man again. I said that he, he, is, he has a secret ulterior motive, and he's always about himself or her. Then notice in verse number 10, where he says, he croucheth and humbleth himself that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He has said in his heart, now watch this, he has said in his heart, God hath forgotten. Here's a man that's gotten by with his sin so long that he says, God's forgotten about it. God's, he's got a memory lapse. Uh, God has uh, Alzheimer's, he has dementia. He's forgotten about it. God doesn't know what's taking place. And then notice, if you would please, he hideth his face. He will never, now this is a bold statement, he will never see it. <clears throat> what a foolish, idiotic yes. um, statement. I'll not say what I was going to say. Don't worry, it wasn't bad. I just want to say what I was going to say. <clears throat> uh, this guy is what I used to say when I was a kid. I hadn't heard this phrase in a long time. I don't know why I came to thought this morning. Brother Slater did that. I looked over and seen him and it just popped right on my No, I, now I can't say it because that's going to be a reflection on him. So, no, no, no. But uh, uh, when I was a kid, uh, we used to say, that guy's an ignoramus. And so, now that's not reflected on Brother Slater. I wasn't thinking that. But uh, anyway, I, got, I told you I shouldn't have said it. I dug a ditch and never get myself out of it this morning. But uh, here is a man who is ignorant. Here is a man who has no concept. He has gotten by with his sin so long that he says, God's hit his face. And God will never see it. He didn't say God don't see it. He said God will never see it. In other words, he is so comfortable in his sin that he feels that he can do it forever. He continues in his lifestyle, his lies, his cheating, his stealing, and his lifestyle. But yet God knows exactly what's taking place. You say, what does that have to do with abandoning to Christ? I'm telling you, there is a lot of Christians today that has a lot of hidden sin and secret sin in the heart, and they live as if God's blind, deaf, dumb, and cannot hear, will never see, and God will never bring his hand of judgment. Notice what he says in verse number 12. The Bible says, Arise, O Lord, O God. Now watch this. Lift up thine hand. Forget not the humble. Let me just say to you, and I don't have time to get into uh, the hand of God in the scriptures. I've studied uh, through the various aspects of God in the scripture. But when God raises his hand, my friend, yes. uh, against you, you're in trouble. And so he's, the psalmist says, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand. Forget not the humble. Wherefore doth the wicked, watch this, contemn God? And the word contempt here in this passage of scripture, just to show you how vile the wicked is and the ungodly, the word contempt literally means to despise. Literally a heart that despises God. And do you know this morning that when we persist in sin and when we live as if God does not see, God does not hear, and God does not consider, we live a life of contempt against God, we despising. It means to scorn. It means to neglect as unworthy of regard. And that's what the word contempt means. In other words, it comes to the place that says that the person literally lives as if God is not worthy to even consider in the matter. And my friend, um, that's much of the place as to where we are today. Um, with things that are taking place way many times, not just the heathen and the uh, ungodly and the wicked live, but how we consider, many Christians consider God. He hath said in his heart, thou will not require it. In other words, thou won't hold me in, uh, accountable. Verse number 14, thou hast seen it, if thou beholdest mischief in spite uh, to requit it at thy hand, the poor committeth himself unto thee, thou art the helper of the fatherless. And so here the wicked man uh, says God doesn't exist. He doesn't regard the Lord God worthy of even consideration. He despises him. But yet the Bible says the eyes of the Lord go to and fro upon the earth. Behold him, the 
good and the evil. And then in verse number 15, now watch this. He, taught, he asked him to raise his hand against him. And he says, break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. And then notice what he says. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. He's not saying he's going to search him till, and he's not going to find any. He's saying that he's going to search him out and destroy all the wickedness in his life until there's nothing left. The Bible says, now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver thee. As I saw verse number 15, be thou, or <clears throat> break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man, he literally is saying that when God raises his hand against the ungodly, He'll break his arm and render his ability to commit sin and to uh, commit his wicked devices. God will totally break that individual. I remember Dr. Ed Blue, the founder of Rock of Ages Ministries, telling a story of a <clears throat> man that uh, he had witnessed to on a number of occasions. The man was vile and wicked. He cursed God and cursed him and constantly was down on the church and beat his wife. And his wife called him one day and said, Brother Blue, I need you to come. Come quick. My husband's in the hospital, and uh, they're saying he's going to die. And Brother Blue um, made his way up to the hospital. And when he walked in, said the man uh, pulled the sheet up over his face and uh, began to tremble and began to shake. And Brother Blue said, I tried to witness to him and said the man literally stood up and he's screaming to the top of his voice, get away from me, get away from me. They're coming to get me. My feet's on fire, my feet's on fire, my legs are on fire, my stomach is on fire. And he moved up toward his head and he stood up against the wall screaming at the top of his voice, no, I don't want to go to hell. Don't take me, I can't go. And the man was vile and wicked. The Bible says that God said, I will consider the wicked. I'll consider the way he lives. I'll consider his actions and his deeds. And God said, I'll break that man's arm that's committed vileness and wickedness. I will render him useless before it's over. Now, I don't want to get into it this morning. I've only got a couple minutes left and I'm trying to get through at least this psalm. But if we want to be abandoned to Christ, even as Christians, we've got to get rid of those secret sins. God can't bless you and I if we're dealing with secret sins in our life nonstop. And I'm going to tell you, there will come a time when that which is done in the secret shall be shouted from the rooftop. God will expose it, and it's going to come out. Notice the Bible says in verse number 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare uh, their heart, and thou wilt cause thine ear to hear, to judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. And so God says, I'm going to hear the cry of the fatherless. I'm going to hear the cry of the widows. I'm going to hear the cry of my people that have abandoned themselves to me. You know, the poor or often taken advantage of. But here God says, um, you just wait. One day I'm going to hear. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch how you handle the widow's might. I'm going to watch how you took care and how you used everything that I gave. And God says, one day, I'm going to raise my hand and I'm going to break you in pieces. We need to be abandoned to Christ. You say, preacher, this is all for the unsaved. The text is dealing with the wicked. But I want to tell you today, our churches are full. And let me just say, it's not just the pews. It's also in the pulpits of our nation. And then I want to give you one last thing, and uh, it's time to close. Um, notice he says in verse number 32, or else while the others, and he's talking about the man that's uh, considering war, and verse number 32 says, or else while the others yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. We have the call, the command, the cost, and now we have the conditions of peace. What is the conditions of peace? Total abandonment. Total abandonment. Abandoning all of our sins, our secret sins, our open sins, our heart, our mind, everything we have, totally abandon it to Christ. I um, 
want to be careful here. I, there's a ex prisoner and the different ones that I've worked with over the years, but there's one particular individual that called me uh, sometime back and he said, I'm going to be honest with you, Brother Ellis. He said, I'm ready to just throw in the towel, go get drunk, go get high on drugs, go out and commit all the sins that I had committed before I found the Lord uh, because of a certain situation, circumstances uh, that took place in his life. He said, I just feel like God uh, doesn't care anymore. He was just like this man in the Psalm that we went through. And he said, I just feel like God has abandoned me. And I said, wait just a minute. God hasn't abandoned you. You've abandoned him. And he began to break and God turned him. And I thank the Lord that he's gotten everything right. The, the Bible says that, and teaches in this passage, if we want complete peace with God, we've got to be willing to abandon our life. And if a man doesn't forsake his father, mother, brother, sister, and even his own life, Jesus said he cannot, in three occasions in this text, he cannot be my disciple. If you want to be a disciple of Christ, and I want to be a true disciple of Christ, we have to abandon everything, including ourselves. And I'll say this, and I've got to close. Brother Steve, get us a course. If we want the conditions of peace, or if we want the peace of God which passeth all understanding, we must be totally abandoned. I've watched it over the years, and um, many times you don't say anything. You just wait on God to work it out. There are other times you have to deal with things. But I've watched it. And I've watched, I have never seen a Christian that was uncommitted or had those secret sins that got by with it for very long. They may have gotten by with it with a few days, a few weeks, a few months, or even a few years. But sooner or later, God says, okay, that's enough. And God raises his hand. We must be willing to abandon for Christ. Give us up. Course, our verse, please, Steve. I think this is pretty. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I be known. Thy faithfulness. Thy faithfulness with my mouth will I make known. Thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. God bless you. Let's get about our responsibilities. <laughs>